The reason it drives prices down, the reason auctions drive out value, is because the number of projects going in, the limited budget that somebody has set, and by somebody I mean the, the government sets and the regulators set, and it's a winner takes all pot. So that places a huge amount of pressure on any developer going into these. So the developer going in knows that it's win or lose, and that's it. So these auctions will fundamentally drive out the exact cost of what it is to produce electricity in Ireland, and not in the same way that Refit did. So why is this auction essentially being targeted as wind and solar? And to when I say this auction, I'm talking about Res 1 and Res 2, because there's a stalking horse in the background here, and that is offshore wind. And that is going to be coming down the road in Res 3, 4. But for Res 1 2, it's probably a little bit too early. Delivery timelines probably don't allow it, unless there's some, some people in this room who will disagree with me with an offshore wind farm that they've got a boat sailing to right now. But the grid connection requirements essentially mean this is going to be onshore wind versus uh, solar. And the construction timelines and the delivery dates mean that everything is going to be quite squeezed. So when we look at solar and we look at the delivery timelines of solar, everyone says construction timelines of solar, no problem, we can meet those deadlines. What they're not really taking into account is the cost and the time of project finance. There's not been a huge amount of project finance on solar in, in the industry. And at the moment, we're going to take a huge batch from uh, the first res auction and dump it on the laps of the lawyers, the banks, and say, OK, finance all these projects. That is not something that uh, they have done in Ireland just yet. So don't underestimate the time it's going to take for everyone to go through those processes. The onshore wind that comes in then has that sort of advantage. David talked about earlier about how we're able to build 500 megawatts a year in Ireland. That's 500 megawatts a year that we've been building consistently. So the delivery of those projects is understood, the financing of those projects is understood, and you can be pretty certain that if somebody says this is a timeline for my wind project, that they can hit it on the head. And that's going to be a crucial, crucial thing for these auctions. Timescales cannot be underestimated in these two auctions. So what about price? Well, solar is the Pandora's box in all of this. So nobody really can predict what the price of these auctions are going to be, but what people have been looking at is the price of, of solar and how that is going to be affected, uh, going to affect the price in these auctions. So the cost of solar across Europe is coming down every, every single auction that happens. At the moment, uh, the EU have uh, wound back their regulations on Chinese imports. So what's that going to do to the cost? It's going to drive it down again, further and further down. So is this something to worry about? Uh, for the Irish market? Is this something to really, really be concerned about for people in this room, for the wind developers in this room? Well, not exactly. The cost of the solar panel doesn't reflect the cost of the EPC, the installation, the O&M. There's not a huge supply chain in, in Ireland at the moment. What is the cost of breakage on the way from uh, China to the back roads of a uh, solar site in Cork or Kerry? The delivery model is, is not yet fun fundamentally done. The, the supply chain is not perfect. It's not as well bedded in as it is in wind. So what is that going to do to their contingencies? For a solar developer, what does that do to your contingency? It might push it up a little bit. It might push it up another little bit. The bank may take a view that they want a little bit more. So that ultimately pushes up the price, and it pushes up their price in the auction, which is crucial. Closing costs and finance, I spoke about the timelines to do that. The timelines around project finance are not fundamentally done around solar. How is that going to affect their delivery dates? Is that going to push their delivery dates back? And how are they going to close all of these projects that are going to come in a glut? You look at one gigawatt for the Res 1 and three gigawatts for Res 2. How is four gigawatts going to get through uh, the financing and closing? And ultimately, what that will do then is it will drive the wind developers to push their prices down. But the cost of solar is not set. And it's something that people in this room have to realize that Solar will come, but it will come at its own price, and not to worry about it, and to just focus on yourself. If you take anything from this talk, it's to take a look at your project, to know your project, to understand your revenues, not solar revenues, to understand your costs, not solar's costs, to understand the cost of financing, and to know your price in the auction. So know your price as much as you can. You have to get it down to the very last detail. So if we look across Europe, what has been happening in Europe? Why have these auctions now been introduced in Ireland? Because fundamentally, these, these, these auction processes have been happening across Europe for a number of years. 
And the reason they're being brought into Ireland is because of the cost reductions they've occur that have occurred in those jurisdictions. The last CFD auction in the UK drove the price down to £57.5 uh, per megawatt. And that was driven by uh, offshore wind. So offshore wind came in um, and drove that price right down. Now that is off the back of, uh, I'll speak a little bit later about participant behaviour. But in the first set of CFD auctions, solar bid in at £50. They bid in at £50 per megawatt, and two projects uh, received those uh, prices. They didn't take those contracts because they didn't think they could deliver. And the reason they didn't, didn't think they could deliver it was because they just threw in an erroneous bid with no punishment. There was a bit of a backlash on that, so they took out the price cap for individuals from that year, and that was driven by solar's behaviour in that auction. What the National Grid then did was they said, okay, well, we can't have uh, people pulling out of the auction, so we'll take off the technology price cap, and the last clearing set price will set the price. And what that did was in the first year of the last CFD auction, round two, you had the price of an well, offshore wind project getting £75 in, in year one, and an offshore wind project selling price at 57.5. Now, that first uh, wind offshore wind price was brought up by a small ACT project. So taking off those price caps because of the, because of the behavior of the solar developers in the first uh, round of CFDs uh, cost the UK taxpayer in the region about a billion pounds by driving up the price of that offshore solar project, or offshore wind project, sorry. So it's something that you have to take into account when you're setting your bid rules. Uh, and it's something that uh, the government here and uh, the regulator will have to watch very, very closely around how they set those bid rules. Price in France, 58 euro. Price in Germany, 49.6. And that last price in Germany is very important because that was the first auction that Germany ever held that pitted solar against wind. And wind, er, wind won zero contracts in that auction. Solar won every single contract. And the reason they won every single contract in Germany is because they understand their market there. The solar market is very well developed. They know their costs and they know what they can deliver on. You would say the exact same thing about the wind industry here. So be brave in your pricing, drive everything you can out, get out of it, and know your price. You have to understand your price, and your price comes from your project, not from anyone else's. Solar will have a lot of risks that they'll have to contend with. Wind won't. You know how to deliver a project, so set your price effectively. So participant behavior, the dreaded winner's curse. We talked a little bit about this uh, just on the last slide there, about how bids can can be thrown in at very low prices that don't necessarily reflect the price that they want. What you need to do in an auction is to bid your lowest price and nobody else's. Don't expect to be brought up because it won't happen. There's been uh, countless cases in the UK, uh, I know because I worked on a couple of the projects, where uh, CFD uh, bids were accepted, projects won very, very lucrative contracts, uh, up to £115 per megawatt, a huge contract, and then the project doesn't close, it doesn't deliver, and the reason for that is because they haven't set all of their contracts dead uh, before they put in their bid. Well, what you'll find is as you go and get closer to the bid, everything is moving around, but when you get to your bid, you've got to set everything in stone. Your EPC contract, your O&M, your financing costs, legal fees, everything, set it dead. This is the bid we're going in, and you're sitting around a table with everyone, you're sitting around, bringing everyone in and saying, this is the bid, and we're setting that. Because what could happen is you could put in a bid and then you get brought up. And as a developer, you get brought up, that's your upside, that's nobody else's. But you'll find suddenly the EPC says, oh, well, actually, I need a little bit more for civils. I need a little bit more to maintain this. Legal fees, oh, yeah, well, we need to close. Uh, and everything will just drip out and you'll lose your upside. So set everyone dead <coughs> when you can. And that is at your bid, that is not a close. So set them dead uh, as early as you can. The participant behavior is derived from the developer risk. So your risk appetite as a developer will, will set your uh, price. So setting your price is down to your risk appetite and it's what you can, what you can move around. What's your contingency? Can I, can I push this contingency further down? Do I need to take all that contingency on civils? I've never gotten, I've never had to pay out on this particular aspect of civils. Can I do without it this time around? Can I, can I push a contingency across my four projects? Can I push contingency across a couple of projects that are close together? I, can, I could possibly work on that. 
do I need to build in a little bit of supply chain risk? Or can I deal with it, do without that? Can the EPC take that? Can that price be taken out and put in? So the bond requirements then will affect this, this, this bid behaviour and this participant behaviour in, in the auction. So one of the key things is a, a, a bid bond and a delivery bond. It's unclear as yet exactly where that will go, but a bid bond will stop sort of erroneous bids. It will drive everyone to put in their own unique bid. And that is the key here. You've got to know your bid, know your price, and put in your own bid. So the deliverability of projects. We've talked about knowing your price and knowing your bid, and the deliverability of a project is the key to understanding your bid. There's a lack of contingency in going into auctions, so you have to understand every little bit of contingency that you have. An aggressive auction timeline, particularly in Res 1, will drive out anyone who doesn't understand their project. So there's potential there for somebody who does understand the price of their project to get a better price this time around than in Res 2. And if you, if you can accept those aggressive timelines and say, I can deliver, be bold and say, I can deliver, then you stand to get a better reward for that. There's a proven win delivery in this country, and that is what you're going up against. You're going up against a solar supply chain that isn't there yet, that hasn't been tested, that hasn't been driven. And you're going up against poor bid strategy. People who look at the price and think, oh, I think it's going to be 65. I'll throw in 60 and see what happens. That's, that's not a strategy that's uh, going to deliver your project. You'll get to financial close. Everyone will have a piece of the pie, and you will not get you. You will not secure your contract, and you'll be kicked out of the next res auction. So it's, a, it's not a strategy that you want to take, tread lightly with. So what do you need to do in the auction reality? So in auction reality world, you've got to separate the woods from the trees. You've got, to, you've got to know that solar will do whatever solar will do. But what you need is to understand your project, know all of the revenues, know all of the costs, understand the cost of comfort, understand the cost of a contingency, and drive out. Understand the cost of your civils. Bring your civil contractor down there. Get them to walk the land with you. Make them understand that every single extra penny is going to go into your bid price. So his job, his work on this job is contingent on him, him or her being as low priced as possible. And make them understand that. Make everyone in the room understand that. The EPC, the O&M, the civils, financing, the legal, everyone's got to understand that every penny they put on goes into your bid price. And if you don't get a successful bid, you don't have a project and nobody makes any money. You've got to be lean and lean and lean. I can't emphasize that enough. Be as lean as possible. I bid in a couple of projects into the CFD auction in the UK, and I understand any little bit of fat it kills a project. We missed out, uh, not by much, but ultimately we were hampered by not focusing on ourselves. I remember sitting in a room with lawyers who were paid way too much to, to speculate, uh, and they were saying, oh, you've got to be under 80. You've got to be under 80. That's where it's going to be bid in, and it was, it was down at 57. Don't listen to anybody. Know your project and know your price. And if you take away nothing else, that is what it is. So thank you.